All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all for the... This is the, the last Stockholm JS for this season. So after this, we will take a small summer break. But um, uh, I'm so happy that we are here for, for, the, for the last one. Last one. And thank you so much, Empire, for, the, for hosting it. You have a really beautiful office and really nice uh, food. Uh, thank you so much for that. And well, my name is Johnny Stromberg, and I'm one of the organizers uh, uh, of the Stockholm JS meetup. And um, well, that was basically everything I had planned to say. So I'm very happy that you're here. And I should also do like a small promo for I'm also organizing the Nordic JS conference, and we are releasing the last batch of tickets uh, tomorrow at 12, uh, 12 lunchtime. And they will most likely sell out in a yeah, during that day. So if you want a ticket, that's the last chance. And it's in October. Would be fun to see some of you there. Uh, yeah, that was all for me. So, uh, Kevin. Yes. All right, cool. Uh, so much fun to see so many people uh, wanted to join us here at the, the Empire Digital office. Uh, so yes, it's a little short introduction, Empire Digital. We're a consultant. Uh, company uh, and we work a lot with uh, web development so a lot of fun that we could host uh, Stockholm JS here today and uh, in case anything happens we have emergencies here <laughs> and that way too <laughs> uh, tolerance just around the corner over there and please help yourselves to have something to drink if you want something more uh, and yeah uh, yeah and by the way uh, yeah, I'm Kevin, as Johnny mentioned, <laughs> uh, and I work here at Empire Digital as a consultant, uh, and I work a lot uh, with front-end development. So I'm looking forward to uh, the topics for this evening. Um, yeah, and I think that was it for me. So, uh, Anton, yes, do you want to start? I can stand up. <laughs> uh, yes, I can start. I'm just gonna switch the microphone. So it mic yeah, it is a microphone. But we're only using it to record the sessions. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I have to speak up. Uh, anyway, now we're going to see if the technology works and this shows up on the TV. Hopefully soon. But well, I can have a beer break in between. That works. Perfect. That was almost the first applause of the day. Uh, all right. So my name is Anton Gunnarsson. I'm a web developer here at Empire Digital. There's other Empire companies as well, but don't tell anyone, we're the best. Um, you can reach me on Twitter on at Anton with a W. Uh, you have my email down here and everything else. Just talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. So today we are going to talk about state machines. And I'm curious how many in the room know what a state machine is. Hands up. There's a lot of people who know what a state machine is. <laughs> Puts the pressure on me because I don't really understand the theory behind it. But uh, this is going to be a bit of an introductory talk, but we are going to look at a library called xState and we're going to look at how that helps us build more robust uh, applications. So for this I have built a small uh, demo application which is probably in Chrome, yeah. Let's see, let's make this a bit bigger for everyone in the back. So we have this uh, game show buzzer. So imagine you're participating in a game show and you have this big red button in front of you that you have to press when you um, uh, are going to answer the question. Down here we have the uh, state this buzzer is currently in, into. Uh, so now it's in the intro state. This is like when we are presenting what I'm doing right now. When we start the uh, show or the question or whatever it is, we click the start button and we can see we move to the idle state. And then we have the possibility to buzz. So when I click the bus button, uh, we go to the bus state and I can, uh, someone can sell, say that this is the incorrect answer or it is the correct answer. If I do the incorrect, we go back to everyone being able to bus again. But if I do correct, we end up in an ended state. So that's uh, what we are building. And we're going to look at a couple of different ways uh, how we do this and how uh, state machines can help you. So uh, let's see if I maybe I have another window over here which are more prepared. Yes. So uh, if we look at how we could do this, and I'm going to switch back to VS Code. Can everyone in the back see that as well? I get a thumbs up. <laughs> uh, I can make it a bit bigger even. Um, 
and we don't have to see that one, maybe this one. So here's one way to do this in React, uh, where we have this uh, component called quiz, which is everything you saw on the screen. It has four states, which represents our four different states that we can be in. So we have the is intro, that's not what I'm gonna do. VS Code is a bit too helpful sometimes. Uh, we have the is intro state, which is like when we are in the intro state, this is true. We have the idle state, we have the bust state, and we have the ended state. And all of this is true when we're in that state. So, and below this we have a, a button, that's the start button. And when we are not in the is intro state, so when we're in any other state than intro, then uh, this is disabled. When we click it, we do uh, a thing with we set intro to false and we set idle to true because that's the next state we want to move to. And we have the same for the other buttons. So when we click the bus button, we set idle to false, we set bus to true. And for the incorrect, it's the bus and idle that switches. And for the last one, we have the same thing, but we also have some analytics that tracks when we have played uh, one of these uh, games. And then we just have the uh, state down here that checks, like if we're in the intro state, print intro, if we're in the idle state, print idle, and so on. One problem with this is that, it, let's say I uh, didn't do the disabled thing here, or it was incorrect, the implementation of this. If we go back to uh, our implementation here, you can see that now we can click both these buttons, but we shouldn't be able to click the bus button even because we're not in the idle state. So if I click the bus button now, you can see, oh, suddenly we're in two states at the same time. And that shouldn't happen. And now you can see suddenly every button is green, which is horrible. So if I click the start one now, you can see it's, it's total chaos. Uh, and we will never uh, solve this uh, a good way. So one way to fix this is to, uh, let's just make sure we're doing this right. I have a, I have a quiz two uh, component, which is doing the, exactly the same thing, but a, a small bit better. So here we have just one state and that state is a string, which is called the intro. So instead of uh, having multiple states for every state we're in, lots of state in this uh, talk, uh, we do it this way instead, that we disable this state if it's not in the intro state, which is the same thing we did in the uh, first quiz, if you remember. So if you're not in the intro state, uh, but on click, we don't have to care about like what state we were in previously. We don't have to set that to false. So in this state, we just say, all right, let's set the, the current state to idle. And then we have the same on the uh, buttons below. Let's set to bus, set to idle, set to ended, and then track analytics game ended. And we just print the state uh, down below. And looking at this, uh, it uh, works the same as before, but we can't really end up in an incorrect state. So if that disable button never got disabled again, uh, and we did this, you can see if I press bus, you can see we go to the bus state, but we aren't still in the intro state. That could happen before. And what we have implemented here is basically a state machine, but we have we have a couple of things that are missing. So for example, like if we uh, suddenly wanted to go to the ended state on another place, we still have to like move the analytics to that. Uh, if we had a button that was like, let's do it, so everyone can follow. So if we had a cancel button, for example, then we had to uh, like, all right, now we can click the cancel button to go to the ended state as well, but we still have to duplicate the analytics stuff. And what we're basically doing is uh, building a state machine. So just to visualize this, uh, I'm using Excalidraw, which is a great tool. You should use it if you aren't. Uh, and we have this thing called our four states, which is intro. And let me just duplicate this a bit. So this is beautiful. So we have our four states. We have intro, we have idle, we have bust and we have ended. So this is the four states in our application. And what we also have is like when we click on our buttons, we are basically sending events to our uh, state machine. So for this example, when the intro when gets the start event, it should go to the idle state. And 
if we're doing this for everyone, it should look something like this. This isn't going to be beautiful, but uh, so when you get the bus event, you go to the bust. When you get the correct event, you go to ended. And finally, also, if you get the incorrect event up here, stop right clicking. There we go. Uh, we go back to the idle state. So this is the state machine for our entire application. And there's like a, a thing called finite state machines, which uh, is how you can map these things to a finite number of states. So if it's infinite, this doesn't work, but if it's finite, then you know that, all right, if I'm in the idle state, I can only go to the bus state when I get a bus event. And the beautiful thing about this is that, uh, at least for JavaScript, there's a library called xState, which makes these uh, things very, very easy and expressive to build. So I have a third quiz. It's going to be a lot of quizzes, but it isn't implemented yet. So we're going to do that now. All right, uh, and we're going to do this, this a bit quick because I'm very slow today. Uh, this is uh, where we're going to implement our state machine. And to do that, we have another file called quiz machine. And here we are importing something called create machine from xState. And this is uh, a function they export that uh, where you specify the specification of your machine. So I've just said that, all right, this it has an ID of buzzer machine. But now we're going to map this to what we did here. So we're going to say that the initial state of the machine is going to be intro. And now it's going to start screaming at me because I, the intro doesn't, doesn't exist. But we can specify that by doing states. And then that's an object. And on this object, we can say this is, these are the states this machine has. So for our case, it's intro, idle, bust, and ended. So we do intro and just an empty object for now. Idle, empty object bust empty object and ended empty object. So now we specify that this machine has four states. And before we move any further, I'm gonna go back to the quiz three and we're gonna use this machine. So to do that, we have a hook from xState that's called use machine. And that's gonna return a uh, a tuple of state and a function called send and we'll get back to that in just a minute and in here we just pass our quiz machine that we exported from the other file so what we have now is that we can see here that our this is our state so instead of just printing state down here i'm gonna print state dot value which uh, usually maps to the name of the state and if we go to our application where I am still showing you the quiz two, <laughs> but here we are at quiz three. Uh, we can see that we have the intro state now. So since we said in our quiz machine that the intro state is the initial state, that's what it's going to show. The other thing we are going to add is that if we go back here is the events. So when we are in intro, we want an start event. So we're gonna say that when on, when we get a start event, we are gonna go to the target idle. And that's uh, how we tell this machine that, all right, this start maps to the idle state. And we can do the same for the other ones. So on bus target is bust. Uh, in the bust one, we have on uh, incorrect, the target is idle, which is going back up like this arrow over here. And then we also have correct, which is target ended. Uh, and now we implemented all this, the events and you can see the ended uh, doesn't have any events. So we're not going to do that. So back in our quiz, we can now use the send function to send events to this machine. So in our button, we're gonna do on click and we're gonna make an empty function and we're gonna send, send the start event. So if we go back to our thing, if I click the start button, you can see it changes to idle. One more time, 
change the title. And we can do the same now for the other uh, buttons as well. Let me do that a bit quick and then bus incorrect and correct. And suddenly that was not what I'm going to do. What have I missed? I have put this on the wrong place. <coughs> Let me fix that. And we're going there. There we go. So start goes to idle, bus goes to bust, incorrect goes back to idle, bus goes to bust, and correct goes to ended. So now we have the logic in the machine instead of in our component. We can also add the disabled things by doing uh, something that's a bit more nice than uh, what we did before. So instead of saying like when we are in this state, then I can send the start event. Uh, we can do something that comes from the state itself. So we can say when we're not able to send the start event. So the can function, it's basically like can this machine receive this event at this moment. So instead of saying we don't care about what state we're in, we just care that can we send this start event over here. So these start maps to each other. And if we do the same thing for the other buttons as well, it should look something like, whoops, prettier is good sometimes, but I don't know where I'm at anymore. Incorrect and Correct. And all right. Uh, so now we can see that we have this button disabled. If I click start, I can click bus, I can click incorrect, I can click bus, I can click correct, and it's ended. All right. So that's uh, great and all. If you want to go to, to the beginning. If I go to the last one. Yeah. I have, it, it hasn't been that uh, way for the other machines either. It's like when you go to the if you click incorrect, you go back. If you click correct, it just ends. That's the end of the game, so to speak. But you can just change it anyway. And that's great, by the way. If you want to change this now, you can just end, change it in here. And you don't have to change the implementation in your component at all. So that's great. We see, the, the thing is, I titled this talk like into the visual world of state machines. This hasn't been very visual. So uh, for my last few minutes, we're gonna take a look at something that's very cool. So we had this thing, which I drew before about how the state machine works. X state also has something they call the X state visualizer, which is over here. So if I just paste my machine and click visualize, I get the entire machine Ooh. visualized. And that's not all. If I click on the start, it simulates the entire machine. So I can click around in this tool and see what happens. And that's not all. Uh, <laughs> if uh, I do this uh, in my quiz 3 and set dev tools to true, you can see that, but now you can. And I go to my uh, index.js and enable a, a plugin they call inspect. Now I'm suddenly in my Let's do it this way, so you can see it. I should really have a window manager, but if you have any tips, please come talk to me afterwards. Uh, all right, so now I have, what the, all right, hang on, hang on. Now I'm, now I'm back, all right. If I'm doing this and I'm doing this. All right, so now this is like the dev tools for Xstate. So now you can see that if I click in my machine, it changes on the right. And if I click on the right, it changes in my application. <laughs> and the final thing about visualizing things with XState is that like, all right, this is all great and dandy. And I mean, when you're developing and debugging stuff, this is great. But what if you want to talk about a flow with a UX designer or a product owner or whatever, then XState recently released something they call the visual editor. So if I click open visual editor in here, I get my entire machine visualized inside, whoops, VS code. And 
if I do something like, all right, I realize that maybe we want the cancel event that we talked about earlier. Like if I'm in the idle state, I want to be able to cancel it if no one knows the question. I can just drag this around a bit. I can say, all right, maybe let's add, that was not what I'm gonna do. Let's add a new event. I did it the wrong way. This is annoying. There we go. It's in beta, I think. Uh, that's called cancel. <laughs> And now I have a cancel event from idle. And if we look over here, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's there. <laughs> so now I have a cancel event in my machine. And this isn't only like these simple things, like I can edit everything. I don't know, I think I have to zoom out a bit because this is very zoomed in. You can see something's appearing. All right, there it is. So here I can actually edit everything about my machine. Like if it, there's a, x state is huge. This is very much the top, but you can have like parallel states and histories and you can say that the ended state should be the final state. So when you reach that one, the machine is definitely over and stuff like that. And so this is extremely cool. If you wanna like collaborate on machines uh, and you can collaborate with anyone because this is visual. You don't have to talk about code. You don't have to like show someone an ugly JSON thing and hope they understand it. And you can also simulate it over here, of course. So you can. But the beginning, uh, the beginning code you need to, to create. Uh, yeah, you have to create like the create machine call, and then everything else you can do in the visual way. Okay. Um, so you just have to do like the, the call to the create machine. That's what op shows you this um, open visual editor thing. Uh, so when you've done that, you can do it in the editor. Uh, and like I said, you can also like simulate it inside this to talk about how it works. Uh, the final thing is I also want to show you because we almost forgot that we had like a small, like in the quiz too, we had this track analytics thing. And instead of having that like in our component, we can just move it to our ended state and say that when we reach this, run this function, whoops. And there we go and let's just import that uh, there we go so there's a lot of stuff this is just a teaser because there's a lot of stuff in x state uh, that i haven't shown you but you can do things like all right when we reach the ended state track this analytics thing and i think that's it questions <laughs> or an applause first <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, any questions? <laughs> or who has the first question? Over there. Have you ever done anything more complicated, like the things that have to you know, validate something or like test? Yeah. Um, complicated, how easy is it to keep the state so that you're not like saying, this guy didn't understand what this is doing or anything like that? I mean, you could definitely end up there, uh, but the visual editor helps a lot. So instead of like, because this is quite a small machine, but let's say it was like five times bigger or 10 times bigger, it's quite hard to get an overview when you look at this like configuration but just opening the visual editor suddenly you get like this compact overview of all the states and how they connect to each other so that works very very well i'm trying the reason i have this game like buzzer thing is i'm trying to build like a game show engine in uh, react which is going uh, so and so but i am using xstate for it and xstate is fantastic i think i have like three nested state machines. So I have one state machine that runs the entire game. I have one state machine that runs every segment of the game. And then I have state machines running every question in that segment. And these communicate between each other with an actor model, which uh, also works extremely well. Uh, and I don't honestly know how I would build it if I weren't using state machines, because it's uh, very complex. Did that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Another question. No, no. Yeah, uh, the question was, I'm just repeating it because I'm recording over here. Uh, but the question was if it's limited to React and it's not. Uh, it's limited to uh, JavaScript if you want to use Xstate. Um, but they have um, uh, libraries or for, I think, every major, you can see React View, uh, React View Svelte is the big one. And then they have another, and then you can just use it in Vanilla, of course. Uh, and they are also, working on official support for running it server-side uh, with JavaScript. Uh, 
with Node. And does this port standard permit to store uh, the Prisma key like the PXML cleanly? Yeah, it should be like the question was if it's compatible with like the uh, state machine standard. Uh, and yes, it should be. I haven't uh, touched that part myself, but according to the documentation, yes. No. Yeah, I found this one and fell in love. <laughs> More questions? If not, I think we're taking a small break and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Perfect, thank you. All right, time for our second presentation. And uh, let us welcome Daniel, who will talk about uh, like GPU effects. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Hey. hey. So my name is Daniel Roos. I'm from Yorda. And we'll deep dive into like the GPU and how you can use it in your web apps to make them more flashy. And I'll start with why we got into this. So we build financial apps, but we also work for customers. And we got a like really funny request from one. It's on a kind of stealth mode project, so it's not live. I can't mention names, but basically they want, came and wanted something really flash, a bit like Siri. It should animate, react to the user, feel native, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and we're doing a hybrid web app, so we're like in the web, and we want something that's non-loopy, really animated and nice. So we looked quickly at alternatives, and like, yeah, we could do video after effects, but it's going to be fairly simple not interactive, it's going to be a loop. We can go with SVG, CSS. You could do this with like some kind of hard work there. A bit tricky, performance, kind of shaky. Um, but that's an option. And then we like the shaders. So definitely like the high performance one. Like every mobile has a GPU. So if we can use that, we're home free. Um, and then it's like a bit of new technology there. So of course, we picked that one. And we kind of dove in to do some proof of concept, see what we could do. And let me start with a mini intro. So this is like the five minute crash course on GPUs and shaders. Um, and it will be relevant for the web parts. So everybody knows like games, GPUs, uh, massive performance, great graphics. Uh, good thing about the GPUs is that they're also programmable. So they're general purpose. So you can use them to mine crypto in the background on a web page. You can use them to do, <laughs> <laughs> do physics, uh, all kind of fun stuff. And of course, they're accessible from JS, which is nice. And they're really accessible. If you check, like, can I use? They're on like everything except Opera Mini, I think. <coughs> there are some caveats on exact versions and you know language supports, etc. But overall, great support. Uh, solid libraries. I think many have heard three JS. How many have heard of it? Super. So like, if you want to do three D graphics, plain vanilla, get a cube spinning. That's the best way to go. This is more like bare metal doing custom stuff. So what happens inside the GPU is you got a pipeline. And at one end, you put in your like models, like a bunch of triangles. Everything in 3D is triangles. So it's like a list of vertexes. Those are triangles. Put in the textures. Um, that goes to the next stage, which is a vertex shader. That takes the triangles, and it kind of moves them in space, does transforms. So you have like perspective and can do a lot of other things too. And then finally, there's a thing called a fragment shader. That's the one we're going to focus on today. This thing is responsible for once you have a triangle, like here on the screen is a triangle. It's like some face or something. This thing determines what color every pixel is. And the final output is your image. And they're all programmable. You program them in a language that looks like C. It's like strict typing, completely different from JavaScript, but it's very simple. So you can pick it up quickly. So the fragment shader, like I said, it's, it's hilariously simple. It's like a function. It takes x and y and returns the color. So it's like, OK, pixel 0, 0, what color is that? OK, it's black. Pixel 0, 1, what color is that? I kind of gray. And you work your way through that. Uh, the language is called OpenGL shading, GLSL. So there are good references online. And you do some quick math. You're like, every pixel. So Normal size canvas, like 1,000, 1,000 pixels, 60 frames per second. Your code is going to be called 60 million times per second. Like, boom, the whole program runs straight through. 
And that, of course, is why we're interested in shaders. They're insanely mind-bending fast. Like, even I have a C, C++ background, and even then you're like always thinking this isn't reasonable, and you put it in, and it's like, OK, it's, it's running at 2% anyway. So they're like really, really fast. Uh, so let's have a look. So writing a shader, uh, we're going to do like a hello world. Uh, first up is something called Shader Toy. Uh, can't recommend this site enough. It's like an awesome site. It has a ton of examples and really good inspiration, and it's a built-in little development environment. So I'm going to use that to like play around with. Uh, if you want to do something very specific, you can go here, find similar stuff, copy-paste it, do that whole thing. So it's a little bit like Stack Overflow for shaders. And like Hello World would be really hard because you can't do text really. That's like advanced to actually print something. That's, that's really difficult, but we'll do like a red rectangle and we'll say that's like Hello World. So here's the shader toy. So I have my code over here. And see if I can make that a little bit bigger. We'll put it over there. So again, it looks a bit like C. You got the void. You have to declare all your variables, uh, numbers. And it's one function. You get some kind of coordinate in. And your only thing you have to do is return a color, like a frag color. And it's RGB transparency. So to do hello world, I can change this to 1. Again, it's very math. It's all floats, 0 to 1 instead of like 255, we have a red triangle. So that's hello world. Uh, we can move on though, so let's make it more interesting. We have parameters in, so we have the frag chord there. That's a coordinate, so we can take the actual pixel we're at, we divide it by the resolution of the screen, which is also a parameter, so now we normalized everything. So we're going to have coordinates like 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. So all this is math, and you typically just want to normalize it to like a simple coordinate system, so you don't care about the real screen resolution. And then I can put uv.x, so I'll put x in for the red color, and ta-da, we got a gradient. Yeah, here we go. It's going to go somewhere, uh, and then we can do that. With a nice gradient, uh, a lot of work for this. You could do this in CSS in about about as much code. But so takeaways here. Um, most important input is our xy coordinate. We get it in the frag chord. We have access to uh, all kind of basic math. So how many people here had math as their favorite subject? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> more. <laughs> You're developers. <laughs> we like math. OK, you, know, I'm, you, you can dust it off fairly quickly. So to make something go a bit like periodic, you got sinus or your cosine. So that, and you don't really see much because it's very slow, so we'll make it faster. Uh, and you can't do a number times 100, you have to make dot zero, so it knows it's a float. It's like super hard typed. There you go, so now you got like a sine wave going in that direction. Uh, you get access to your sine, x, all the normal math function, and some utility ones. So there's like special interpolation functions to make smooth step and textures easier. Um, and using this, you can go a bit further. So let me skip on there. You got a couple of more inputs. So you have something time, so a number that just counts up, and you have like mouse coordinates, and then you can put whatever you want in there. And I'll do a demo later on when we get back to the little make the Siri button where we actually make it do something. Um, so here's a shader again with a gradient, and I can do two things to it. I'm too lazy at typing, so I got it commented in here. The first thing is we'll add in if the length of our vector, so remember 0, 0 is down here, we'll get a vector. If the length of this thing is longer than the length of the mouse coordinate then we return the color, otherwise it's black. And I run that, and now I can click and drag. Mm -hmm. So it's taking my mouse coordinate, and then it's truncating everything outside that, uh, like a nice circle. And I can also change here, now it's like RGB, so we can change this color to be time dependent. So we'll keep the kind of blue wavy lines there, and we'll add in something that depends on time. 
And now we've got some kind of nice, I don't know what this is, uh, neon kind of cool. So you could just uh, like a sunshade or something with this. So what have we got so far? We have a shading language. We run the code once per pixel. We've got really simple functions to build on, but it's a nice toolkit. So what can you do if you have more than a couple of minutes with this? Uh, you can do trippy stuff. So here's one example. You know, Shader Toy has like all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh. Oh, so you have like, you can navigate around, it's Minecraft, it's Tron, it would be like a great background on a web page. And the code is for this 270 lines or something. So I guess it's a 2K download to get this running on a web page. And it can be fully interactive. Uh, I mentioned physics. So the cool thing here, compared to effects you can do in like CSS and other parts, is that it can be physically modeled. So here is like an ocean. Cool. I think this is gorgeous. They got the lighting right, they got a nice feel for it. This one is. I think it's a bit shorter, about 200 lines. And it's not a movie, it's completely interactive, so I can change it. I can go in and like tweak the stuff. And that's the fun with Shader Toy. You go in and like, okay, the sea height, let's make storm. So now we've got big waves. And then of course you go like, but it's a number, what if it's negative? So I'll put in something like minus here instead. Oh yeah, thank you, minus. And the dot, yeah, I see it. And then you get some kind of funky waves seen from underneath or whatever this is. So it's a lot of fun to just take these kind of things and play around with them. Um, okay, so we can do graphics. Getting to JS, so back to kind of why we're here. So how, how do I do this if I want this on a web page? This is all in Canvas. So it's like a standard Canvas element. And the Canvas, you can draw like little 2D stuff and you can also give it a WebGL context. As soon as you do that, you get the 3D access. Mm -hmm. If you do it native, you have to actually do the triangles. So you have to put two triangles to get a square, give it the code, tell it to compile it, and feed the time to it, etc. I found one library, GLSL Canvas, I liked. It does exactly this. It's super small. I checked the code, it's like a couple hundred lines to just do the basic connect code to the canvas. Um, beyond that, think about transparency. So often if you do an overlay, you need to have like your shader generate transparent images, the canvas be transparent, and the library you're using to enable it. And then it's pretty basic. So here's the minimal code. Just get the library and then, um, yeah, create a canvas element, grab an existing one, send it to this GLS canvas, and then put the code in. And that's literally all you have to do to get the basic thing running. And then it's a bit more if you want to like feed in your own parameters or do something specific. But the integration is like, was, that was the easiest part. And then back to our examples, so we need to show one like kind of thing. So, uh, for this, we had an app. So, and this, I can't show the real one, so this is just like a mock-up. So it's a big button, I can click it, the counter goes up, it's not so exciting. Then I can enable the shader, and I get, this looks really good on a phone, but you get this kind of mesmerizing spinning effect. I think I have it in here. And here's another version of it. So it's some kind of like thing, it doesn't loop, they're on different periods, so they kind of move infinitely. And then when I click it, uh, it has to do something. So this one does a little spinny thing, which is better than just, you know, highlighting the bottom. Um, only difference here is I have one more parameter that I send in, and then I control that from JavaScript. So it'll counter that just spins it around. And there we go. So I'll do two things. So like, if you're interested in this, um, definitely check out Shader Toy. I would recommend the GLSL Canvas library because it's dead simple, but there are other choices. This is some kind of guru. I can't pray it's Spanish, Equel is something. He's done work for Pixar. He does these really good tutorials. He's got like a 20 minute one that I would recommend where he just builds a palm tree and a sunset and you get like all the basic math functions. And he also did this one. Um, 
So this like happy bouncy thing is 500 lines of well commented readable math code that he does in like a six hour live coding session while taking Q&A. So that's like if you're the grandmaster ninja, you can sit down and just type math and you get this kind of thing in 2K. Um, <clears throat> But summarizing this, so this was like a real rabbit hole. Uh, you can have just like a hobby thing. It's fun to play around and see what you can do. But for serious applications, the things to note is like from JavaScript, you got first class access to the GPU. It's fully supported everywhere, so you can count on it. Uh, the techniques you use are Canvas and WebGL. So that's like super basic entry point. Integ <clears throat> integration is quite simple. That's not a problem. And what you get is benefits really small footprint. It's not going to bloat your app or bloat your web page. So you can put something really small in and get like spectacular effects on a web page on like the first load. Um, you need to like math, uh, at least like refresh some of it. Uh, you can copy paste a lot, but there is definitely math in here. And the final warning is use it for special effects. Like these kind of things like the halo are really good. But if you're going to do like a city or something really 3D, then 3JS standard models will get better performance because they use like the full GPU pipeline. So it's like a kind of special case. Yes? What kind of hardware do you need for doing this? <coughs> None. None? Your standard phone has a GPU. Oh, cool. So all of the stuff, like the basic stuff, uh, runs perfect on like any normal phone. This kind of thing, I haven't tried this on mobile. This might not work. I don't know. But for all the kind of like basic things, they work really well. Looks like any phone that can play like a little 3D game definitely has a strong GPU. And if you can play Candy Crush or something, then, then you're home free. So Android 2.3 has a requirement to have a GPU. So. Uh, 2.3, then I think we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call, call it safe. Anyone uses 2.3? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. So that's it. So yeah, questions? An applause first. Yeah, applause first. Yeah. I forgot to applause. In the back. When it came to the visual designing for this kind of um, effect that you've shown, um, did you work with a designer to actually come up with a solution that they could make, make, maybe <coughs> make something to export into these libraries, or did you just try to match it as much as possible? Yeah, th that's a really good question. So we actually worked the other way around. So the designers had a couple of like mock ups in like After Effects and some concept ideas. And then we looked at it from like, how would this kind of work or be expressible? So we could see like shapes in it and they were like, this is some kind of spheroid. This is a kind of like arc thing. We can get them to move. We'll add some warping to it. So we basically got the designers to do something they wanted. And then we figured out how to do it with like some fairly simple modeling. I just want to mention that like Maya and the effects and many Adobe products do have filler editors. Exactly, so you could use that. So if your designer knows those and can use them, then uh, providing they're not too complex, like there is a difference, like some stuff runs really well on the desktop and like on the mobile, there are some like, you know, levels to this GLSL that they don't support and they're a bit weaker. And I guess Unity has one and I guess it can, so um, you can choose, I guess, the OpenGL version you want to support and this one exactly. either with GLSL or, or with GL for that. Yeah, then it's going to be compatible. So that's a really good idea too. If you don't want to like do the hand authoring of them. What was the thought about the headline there? It's a good rabbit hole. What, what, what do you mean? A rabbit hole kind of thing where you can go down like Alice in Wonderland. It's you go down and it's this incredible world that you can like, explore. Oh. So you can spend a lot of time in it. Huh. And it, so ba once you get tweaking this, you're like, I'll just change this, make this a little bit different, do this, and it's like takes time because you're like playing around with it. I thought were rabbit holes were bad. Uh, no. Oh, well, I, in this case, depending on how you read Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> apparently it's a lot of like literature yeah. <laughs> interpretation there. We're not there. in Kansas anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think I might know the answer, but would you choose shaders again if you did something similar? Yeah, for this case, definitely. But actually, the, it didn't take that much time. It took like, Basically, I think two, three days from start to end to do like the, do you get like a spinning button with a halo kind of thing that looked nice. Wait, and we're gonna, 
When you like math. When you like math. <laughs> and then we're going to reuse the same thing for others. There's some kind of like water effects later on, so there's more use cases in the pipe for it. Otherwise, if it's a one-off and it's like not a main feature, then I would probably just do an animation. Here we had a license to get creative, like, like do something really nice. But you're like a math major or an avalist. Uh, no, no, uh, physicist. Oh. So not pure math. And it was a long time ago, so like you forget stuff. I was talking to somebody here that if you went back, you would literally not pass a single test. So I mean, you forget everything. <laughs> this is one opportunity to do a refresher. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Most important question. <laughs> I should stop this one. I know it's like hysterically, like, ah, my brain's exploding. <laughs> I think it was nice with the, the test environment because when I've been like playing around with shaders, I usually like just end up in like, because I'm used to just console log stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like, How does it work? Console log, and I'm like, no, you can't console log. You should be shaders. No, they so don't. Like, yeah. That's like the first thing. They don't print. There's no way, really good way to debug them. And yeah, just getting text in there is like a nightmare. Yeah, so that was a good, uh, really good tip. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, have fun and maybe find some use for it in work or just, just play around. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, super interesting talk tonight. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be over yet. Feel free to stay here, mingle, talk, maybe ask uh, Daniel some extra detailed questions about uh, the, the, the intricacies of everything. Uh, and help yourselves to something more to drink as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been super fun to host this. Thank, Thank you all. You. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you.